So let's um, settle in for a half hour meditation. And I'll offer some, some reflections, some invitations that you can just include if, if they're helpful in your awareness. Sitting right in the middle of our experience. A sense of being located right here, wherever here is. But there can be a sense of the center, some center to our experience. And that's where we can return to when our mind gets distracted and pulled out into more peripheral thoughts, the body here and now is a very useful support object of mindfulness. So taking some time to settle in, to land here and now with the body as it is this evening. Maybe taking a few deep breaths, completely filling and emptying the lungs a few times if you wish. Maybe one more deep breath, if you wish. And letting the breathing continue on its own. No need to control it. Letting it have its own rhythm. So there are many experiences that we're sensitive to, hearing and touching, the physical sensations, air on the skin, butt on the cushion, hands wherever they're placed, any aches and pains in the body, any places of tension, places of relaxation in the body. as a way to support this continual settling and arriving. If you wish, I can lead us through a body scan, just a simple way of bringing attention to the body. So we can begin with the crown of the head, any sensations there, just receiving them.
Moving down, feeling the brow, inviting the brow to relax and the back of the head, sides of the head. Inviting the eyes to relax. Don't need to be holding them with tension. The whole face and jaw can relax. Inviting the throat to be open, undefended. And feeling the tops of the shoulders. Again, inviting them to drop if they're habitually tensed. Feeling the chest and the back, upper back. Inviting a downward release of any energy held there. <clears throat> Flowing into the arms and the hands, wherever they're placed. The whole torso can relax, abdomen, lower back, feeling supported by the base of the body on the earth. pelvis and sits bones can relax. Resting on the earth. And including the legs and the feet. And then having a sense of the whole body sitting upright, supported by the earth. Different parts of the body connected to each other. A sense of the whole body as a whole. including any areas that maybe we missed, including them all in awareness, any areas that are asking for attention. And noticing the pleasure of being aware, being attentive to the body. Even if there's pain in the body, see if you notice any pleasure just from being present, from being connected. Maybe feeling the rhythm of breathing throughout the whole body as a soothing 
in and out flow that we don't need to control. It's more like the breathing breathes us. Nothing we need to push away, nothing we need to hold on to. Simply resting in moment to moment mindfulness of the different changing conditions, sounds and physical sensations, thoughts, emotions. We don't need to be for or against them, but we can rest in our center this center of presence, embodiment, relaxation, and have a more peaceful, dispassionate relationship to whatever moves through awareness. The emphasis being on the awareness itself, the pleasure of being aware, of being mindful, being present, and less emphasis on what we're aware of. That can be nature doing its own thing. We don't need to control it. So let's continue in this way, finding your own way to stay connected, to stay interested in awareness, present moment awareness, to stay relaxed, returning to the body when the mind gets distracted, confused about what to do. It's very simple. Just sitting, knowing that we're sitting.
So as we near the end of the meditation, maybe letting go of directing the mind towards any particular aspect of your experience, simply resting in awareness and appreciating your efforts, appreciating any pleasure in the mind from cultivating mindfulness, being present, no matter what we're aware of, we were aware of. So just enjoying the last few moments, being aware. So thanks for being here. Um, so I've been leading this group twice a month since January, and we've been moving through um, a list of 10 virtues from the Buddhist tradition called the Paramis, which uh, literally means perfection. Um, that may or may not be a useful translation for you. Um, virtue is a more neutral, maybe, translation. Um, the list comes from the story that the Buddha to be, so before the Buddha was the Buddha, um, sort of the myth, the myth is that uh, these 10 qualities were qualities that he developed to perfection just really over many lifetimes and so there's fun stories about him in different lifetimes developing one or the other like patience or truthfulness and the idea is that then when the when the Buddha had his big understanding and was free from suffering and decided to teach that in addition to having deep insight and <clears throat> um, wisdom, he had all these other virtues. Sometimes I think of the paramis too as sort of personal power. Like you meet some people and they just, you know, and we all have our different strengths. You know, some of the other paramis are energy. You know, you might meet someone, they just have a lot of energy. And like, you know, they're just always doing stuff and applying themselves, energy or persistence at sometimes translated at, as or or goodwill so just people where you just you know it just kind of seems effortless for them to have goodwill to kind of be radiating kindness um, and the beautiful thing you know is to use these this list not in order to judge ourselves about how we don't measure up but to recognize that these are all potentials in our heart and that um, in reflecting on them and even memorizing this list, um, they can be more in the back of our minds <clears throat> and more available to call on and to bring to bear in, in the midst of our life. Um, so they're... Yeah, I think they give us a, a different perspective on the challenges of life, to see the challenges of life as opportunities to, to develop these qualities in our heart. Um, well, 
like patience. <laughs> um, and yeah, it just, life gives us endless opportunities to, when we look at them, and that's the power of these is, you know, when we have them more memorized or more available when we're thinking about them, and especially if we think about them and contemplate them and they do resonate as meaningful to us, as inspiring, then we can actually apply them. We can actually ask a question like, what would goodwill look like in the situation where my goodwill is being tested? Or patience or like tonight equanimity, which is kind of a, a balance of mind, steadiness, stability, you know, kind of being less thrown around, pushed around by the inevitable ups and downs of life. Um, you know, what does that look like in, yeah, all the little and big insults of life or the ways we get caught up um, with striving, holding on? Yeah, so the idea is to use them in ways that support us in strengthening our hearts so that they're more able to meet life as it is. Um, so they're really, they're, yeah, they're, we, there's some work that we need to do in, in thinking about them in order to take them from the level of ideal, like that's something nice theoretically to how is this actually useful? Because that's always the question is less about um, thinking about things abstractly and more, in, in my understanding, Buddhism is all, is very practical. It's, we've got this problem, most of us, probably, hope, probably all of us in this room on this call, this problem, which is that we're human beings that have a problem a lot of the time things aren't satisfying to us on some level, or they, they're satisfying and then things change. And, um, and this is stressful. And, and then we often tend to react to that ordinary stress of life, of change, of um, uncertainty, vulnerability, suffering, pain, in ways that don't actually resolve that, or, uh, that can even make it worse, you know, distracting ourselves, procrastinating on things we need to do. Um, yeah, denial, distraction, or overindulgence and um, trying to kind of numb our sensitivity in different ways, acting out our irritation in ways that aren't, isn't helpful and just creates more problems that we then need to <laughs> try to resolve. So this is the reactivity of our minds. And this is where the Buddha said that there can be an end to suffering, not on the level of just the ordinary pains and pleasures of life that just comes with life. Um, even the Buddha, after his awakening, experienced physical pain, experienced praise and blame. People didn't like what he was saying. His cousin tried to kill him. <laughs> um, but as the story goes, his mind, there was no more uh, inclination towards greed or aversion or delusion. And this is an interesting thought what what that would be like and we we can't really know but we can know in our own experience times when we're more and less reactive and a great way to experience a little bit of equanimity is to have a little bit of peace and happiness even in a meditation set even just to turn our mind away from everything that's agitating that we could think about and attend to something calm or soothing or neutral then you might notice, if you have a little momentum of that awareness, how everything feels a little bit more spacious and the real problems that we might think about in our life, there's a little more, yeah, there's a little respite from that, a little distance, a little space. Um, obviously we can start thinking about them again, but 
but that's one way to access equanimity, um, to get a taste of it, is in states where the mind is more calm and happy. But that's temporary, because then, you know, we, we sit and have maybe have a nice sit, we feel really peaceful, and then we get up and we have to do stuff. <laughs> and there's the same irritations. And so it's, it's wisdom that understands um, on a deeper level how to be at peace with things as they are. And that's the deeper kind of equanimity um, where the mind has some understanding about the causes for suffering and the causes for release from suffering. Uh, and we see that in the moment. And that kind of insight is really supported by calm because it's really hard to have perspective on our mind and, and its patterns when we're just embroiled in them and caught up in them and, and too busy or too overstimulated. It's just kind of a, a mess. You can't really see clearly. So that's why meditation and in general, you know, a lifestyle that supports calm and more simplicity and less, yeah, overstimulation, um, living ethically, trying to live harmoniously really supports our mind being overall a little more settled, which then supports being able to see more clearly. Oh, it stands out then. If our mind is a little more peaceful, then the stress that the mind creates for itself stands out in, con in contrast a little bit more. So we can think of equanimity in different ways. You know, on the ultimate level, equanimity is sort of one characteristic of a mind that's no longer creating its own stress. So um, you could say it it's, has the flavor of the goal of practice is this, this um, ma a mind that has a peace access to a peace that's not dependent on conditions. And that's a provocative idea because usually we think about our happiness as dependent on conditions. Um, but even before, you know, even as we're still very much beings that have preferences and that uh, experience stress and get caught up, we can still be practicing equanimity um, with our reactivity. And that's really kind of that on the level of training what we do, you know, and we can do that in different ways. But I think one, one helpful way of thinking about it is that equanimity isn't just an end in and of itself, although it, it could be that because it is peaceful, but it's also a support for other qualities, like it's much easier to apply ourselves with effort to what's useful, to what's skillful, if there's more equanimity, um, if we have, if we are inclining our mind to be less reactive, you know, if, we're, if we get less react, if we're less reactive, then we're more functional. Um, we all know, and it's not like it's always in our control, but when things come up and the mind has strong reactions, it can really um, throw us for a loop. We can lose um, what little control we can feel we have and just, yeah, less agency to apply ourselves in skillful ways. So it's kind of a wisdom quality, equanimity about recognizing that we we don't have full control over a lot of things. And so equanimity in that sense is skillful in that context, like in the context, context of the weather. Most people, because we understand that we can't control the weather, we might uh, complain, but on a certain level, we have some equanimity about it. Maybe <laughs> some of the time, I mean, gets Minnesota, it gets to March in winter and, maybe we're, we're out of equanimity, but 
Um, but I think as just a, as an example, um, yeah, you know, there's there is a level where we're we're not going to be putting a lot of effort into trying to change the weather. So there's a kind of acceptance that we can have. Um, and the point here is that there, there may be areas where equanimity is skillful and areas where it isn't. This is Tanisaro Bhikkhu made this point in a book that I've been reading on, this, on the whole topic of the paramis, good heart, good mind. Um, he's a Buddhist monk, lives in California and a scholar and often has, in, in my mind, kind of interesting, maybe alternative takes like this take I had never heard before, but according to him, equanimity in the Buddhist, Buddhist teachings is never recommended as a good thing on its own. It's always recommended in conjunction with right effort and other skillful qualities. Um, and I think this makes sense if we think of equanimity as sort of acceptance of things as they are there's some things we shouldn't accept. Like if the mind is caught up in its own suffering, just digging a hole for itself, or you know, even causing suffering to others, we need to do something about that. Nobody else is gonna do anything about that. So equanimity in the sense of acceptance isn't actually skillful in that situation. Um, what he says relatedly is, he says uh, to Mr. Bhikkhu, you have to be equanimous about the kama, so kama is the same as the word karma. Um, kama is Pali, karma is Sanskrit. And the one good translation of karma is just intentional action and that int our intentional actions have results. So he says, you have to be equanimous about the kama you've already done along with its results, but not about the kama you're planning to do in the present. So just that, that difference, like, yeah, Kind of, we can't do anything about our past actions. They've they've already happened. So we, it, it, so it's helpful. It's skillful. You know, it helps soothe whatever you know regret we might have or pride to be more equanimous. Like, yeah, that's said and done. In a sense, somebody else did that. <laughs> now I have to. Now I'm experiencing the results of that. But there's nothing I can do about that. But this present moment, there's a lot that's at play that I can have some influence on. So this is really where I should put my attention and my efforts. And he says, equanimity can also be applied to uncertainty about the future because that moment hasn't come yet. So we don't know how things will unfold and we can bring equanimity to bear on that. There's a lot of things we don't know, you know, how they will unfold for ourselves personally, collectively. So we can have some equanimity that, yeah, there's a lot of possibilities. We don't know how they'll unfold and the best way to, you know, to act or to affect change for ourselves or for the, for the world is what we can do here and now. So this is helpful, I think, because if we think of equanimity as sort of always applicable, then we can get into some, uh, some passivity that isn't, isn't helpful in all situations. Um, and I think, this is what's sometimes called maybe the near enemy of equanimity, like indifference or nothing matters, you know, um, some defeatism. And it's easy to, to fall into that because there are, we do hear teachings in Buddhist circles about accepting things as they are, but that's a skillful means. And that's, I think, always something to keep in mind sort of, if you're looking for an ultimate truth in Buddhism, at least in early Buddhism, the Buddha said, I only teach one thing, suffering and the end of suffering. So it's really pragmatic, it's really practical. And then all the other teachings are just in service of that, so they're skillful means. So the question with equanimity is, when is that useful in helping us move away from suffering, move in the direction of happiness and peace? And when may it not be skillful? Apparently, Ajahn Chah, who is this Thai forest master, um, he died in the 90s, I think, but was really influential kind of in the transmission of this um, tradition of Buddhism to the West. 
there was a little story about a monk practicing with him and Ajahn Chah went to see him and his roof was uh, broken of his little hut and there was maybe it was raining and rain was coming in and and the monk was just sitting there not doing anything and said that he was practicing equanimity and Ajahn Chah said something like that's the equanimity of a water buffalo <laughs> and you should practice the equanimity of a human or something like that so yeah just this point uh, about the skillfulness, uh, different, you know, skillful equanimity being appropriate to the situation. Another example Tennis Rabiku gave to make this point is saying we should have the equanimity of a physician, of a doctor. So part of the skillfulness of equanimity is it allows us to put aside things that we can't change in order to address things that we can change. So like a doctor, if they're looking at someone like, oh yeah, that's, you know, this problem, you know, you can't, you know, there's some injury and, you know, it's kind of maybe a chronic injury. You can't necessarily solve that, but there are maybe some things you can do to mitigate it or I don't know. But anyways, the point being, you put some things aside to focus on things that, that you can have some change, you can affect some change with. So, I'll give some examples of what I think could be examples of skillful equanimity where we could apply equanimity. And a classic one is in relationship with other people. Um, there's another list of four, what are called Brahma Viharas, divine abodes, qualities of the heart, um, goodwill, compassion, appreciate, appreciative joy, and equanimity. And in this context, equanimity, you know, it's interesting that it's included in this list of heart qualities, but I think it's really essential for our relationships that there be some degree of equanimity. And we see this with people we're close to. We might have a lot of goodwill, a lot of affection, but we can also be attached and want them to be a certain way. And, even controlling at times. And so equanimity is what allows us, you know, we could say equanimity is about having good boundaries where we understand that they're a separate person and they have their own path, they have their own life, they have their own mind. And this kind of marriage of goodwill for somebody and understanding that there's a traditional phrase that goes, your happiness and unhappiness depend on your actions, not my wishes for you. And that, that's the traditional equanimity phrase. And it, it can sound cold, but I think a better word is probably cool. There is a coolness to it. Um, but in my experience, that coolness is what really allows our hearts to give goodwill in a really open way, as opposed to, you know, I really care about you and I really need you to be a certain way. Uh, a simile used for this kind of love is a grandmother's love for a grandchild or grandparent um, probably has a little more spaciousness and equanimity than of a parent with a child but there's still a lot of love but you know a little more spaciousness like well partly not as much my problem <laughs> but but also just knowing having having parented a child already and just knowing you know that they have their own their own path and ups and downs. So that's one place we can experiment with with equanimity. Yeah, this this understanding of otherness, you could say, in our relationships. And just that question, does that actually support us being close in, in a skillful way to understand? Um, boundaries, that somebody else is a different person. Uh, and then another area is in our own life with the inevitable ups and downs of life. There's this list called the eight worldly winds, which is just a summary of the inevitable, yeah, ups and downs of life, gain and loss, praise and blame, fame and disrepute, pain and pleasure. So that's just what happens. 
And it's not that we don't have preferences. Obviously, we prefer pain, uh, pleasure to pain, mostly. <laughs> Depends, I guess, but um, generally. And the, yeah, I think the point is that if we have this understanding that these, these are part of life and they move through life just like winds, then again, it's just a, a matter of where we're putting our attention and our efforts. We could, and a lot of people do, because we may not have a sense of another option, devote all of our time and energy in life to sort of maximizing pleasure and minimizing pain. And that's a totally logical approach to life if, if you're sort of viewing things on that level, if that's kind of how you're measuring what makes for a, a meaningful, satisfying life. And on a, there's nothing wrong with that other than that it's limited and probably frustrating because you try as you might, you can't control everything. So equanimity, having more equanimity around that, then we can use our energy, you know, to, for example, develop the paramis. So like a very simple example, if we're stuck in traffic, we could use our energy to be frustrated about that, or we could use our energy to contemplate, oh, this is, this is life. Sometimes this happens and develop patience or equanimity around that. And that, and so the idea is that these, like these paramis, for example, but just in general, developing our heart's strength and wholesome intentions and yeah, wholesome skills of mind is a better investment, you could say, in terms of our long-term happiness than just getting what we want, getting rid of what we don't want. So it's, a, it's just a matter of, you could say, trading, trading up. So it's not that sense pleasure is bad, having nice things, having good friendships, all the things that we enjoy about life. Real, there's real gratification there. Um, but there's also limitations because those, every, all those conditions are ultimately impermanent and unreliable in the, in the deepest sense. And not just that, but also cultivating the dependence on them kind of leaves our mind vulnerable. And on some level, we can sense that. And so the idea is that, for example, equanimity, like the happiness of equanimity, the happiness of not that we don't have preferences, but that we're okay, we could be okay. We could imagine things changing and basically being okay. It's not that we wouldn't like it, not that we wouldn't grieve when things change, but we could, we could handle it, we could take care of ourselves. That that's, that confidence is maybe a deeper, sat, more satisfying happiness. And so with our limited time and energy then, you know, how do we, yeah, where are we putting that? You know, often we talk about the, the happiness, the peace of letting go. And it's, it's a profound, it's so simple, but it's a profound teaching. And again, it, it may be something where it's not an, an ultimate truth applicable in every situation, but certainly in situations where, where we're resisting things as they are and, and we, we don't have control, letting go can really be, yeah, a great relief, a great release. So I want to talk a bit about what supports equanimity. So how, um, like if we are caught up in clinging in some way or resisting, what actually supports the mind? Uh, letting go, letting be, being with, yeah, having more acceptance of things as they are. So one way is to reflect, bring in some contemplation about just the way things are, you know, that things, 
these are teachings that um, the Buddha gave to sort of counter ways that we typically tend to look at things. So looking at things as impermanent, that everything that has the nature to arise has the nature to cease. You know, all things must pass. And what effect does that have when we bring it to mind? And again, it may not always be helpful. There may be times where, you know, that brings up a lot of reactivity. But there may be times where it really cools our reactivity. Um, I think it's Thich Nhat Hanh said, when, you, when we're having conflict, caught up in some drama, just picture everyone that is involved in that, including ourselves, in 300 years. <laughs> so impermanence, also this unreliability, just that conditions are never what we always hope for, to get things just the way we want them and they will stay that way. Has that ever happened? <laughs> There's just, you know, life has these peaks, these ebbs and flows, these beautiful moments and then they pass and that's just kind of the nature of things. So in a way, this is a corollary of impermanence. Things never last long enough to really satisfy us on that deepest level that we're looking for satisfaction and that may seem like a big bummer and something we don't want to think about. But again, the question is, is that skillful in releasing some, releasing some clinging? Um, letting, you could say, letting in that truth that, of unsa that it's unsatisfying. And yeah, you know, maybe we can handle that. Maybe we can handle Maybe we can be more honest about that, and that can help us be more skillful in doing what we need to do in life and trying to meet our needs. But any expectation they're going to be met perfectly maybe is just a setup for suffering and, yeah, conflict. So there's that's a deep teaching, and there's a lot more we could say about that. But... Um, yeah, the, the Pali word is dukkha, and the one way of translating it is just like a wheel that's out of true. So it's just like, doesn't quite fit. And for me, these teachings, instead of being depressing, are actually really kind of affirming, like, yeah. And it's not that, you know, there isn't happiness in life, but it's more that that expectation and wanting uh, things to be final, that doesn't seem to happen. And so then maybe that can just change our orientation to where we look for happiness, less in getting everything just right forever, and more in, again, sort of developing our heart's skills to be nimble and creative and responsive in the reality of changing conditions. Anything can happen anytime. And what kind of mind and heart could be even enlivened by that and fully engaged with that? And then there's the impersonal nature of conditions. And this one can be hard to understand, but you can sense how it could really support equanimity. Because so often where our reactivity comes from is that sense that everything's personal. It's my anger, it's my friend, you know, treating me without respect, it's my life, it's my to-do list, it's my body with my pain, and all those things in and of themselves, they may be challenging, but is it really mine? In what sense is it mine? And so another way to think about this is that whatever we experience, externally, internally, that it's, it's nature. You know, it's the nature of anger. It's the nature, you know, whatever. We can see that it's just kind of a lawful unfolding, whatever's arising. And the question again is if seeing things in that way as nature, not self, does that support equanimity? Does that support actually being able to engage and take responsibility for our mind, but not needing to take it so personally. Sayadaw Tejaniya, this Burmese monk who is really a wonderful teacher, contemporary, 
says the, the mind is not yours, but you're responsible for it. So there's, there's that sense even that seeing things in that impersonal way can actually, you know, then we have less, we, we can have less shame around, you know, our unskillful qualities, less pride and needing to uh, defend and show off our skillful qualities. And then it's, the question is more, how do we set in motion what's skillful? Because it's, it's skillful, because it's a good thing to do. So we may actually be able to take more responsibility, be more skillful with our minds, seeing them as just nature, nature unfolding that we are responsible for. One way to get a sense of equanimity is to think about something that we were really passionate about or really obsessed with, a relationship or a kind of music or an artist when, you know, like 10 years ago, 20 years ago. And just that coolness that we have towards that now. Um, So yeah, in terms of just sensing the skillfulness, I think coolness is a great metaphor, great word. And, uh, and it's, it is still provocative because I think we get a lot of messaging about the kind of the peak of happiness. I think especially maybe in mainstream American society, just so much emphasis on sort of uh, kind of, um, I don't know, excitement and uh, so the peak, peak happiness is, yeah, gratification and success and sort of um, intensity. And the Buddha said the, happy, the highest happiness is peace. So that's a very different orientation. So in that sense, coolness, yeah, it's just sort of, uh, we can, we, I think it, it is an acquired taste if we're not used to it, but like, can we imagine just, yeah, that, that, that really being supportive, not in even dulling out, you know, the richness of life, but in a way being more able to experience it all fully because we're less pushed around by it, um, Yeah, it's like it can touch us deeply, the 10,000 joys, 10,000 sorrows of life, but we could still be peaceful around it. There could still be a coolness that understands, yeah, sometimes it's like this. Life is intense. Life is beautiful. Life is hard. You know, all, everything that we experience. And it's not a surprise. It's like this sometimes. So just that coolness that actually could support us meeting things as they are. So I'll read a few things and then open it up for discussion and see what thoughts you all might have on this topic. I'll just read a few things from the ancient discourses. So this is from the Dhammapada, which is a, um, a series of verses. So it's kind of a long poem. This is a section of it. As a solid mass of rock is not stirred by the wind, so a sage is not moved by praise and blame. As a deep lake is clear and undisturbed, so a sage becomes clear upon hearing the Dharma. Virtuous people always let go. They don't prattle about pleasures and desires. Touched by happiness and then by suffering, the sage shows no sign of being elated or depressed. And then something from a discourse the Buddha gave to his son, Rahula. Rahula, develop meditation that is like the earth, for then agreeable and disagreeable sensory impressions will not take charge of your mind. Just as when people throw what is clean and unclean on the earth, feces, urine, saliva, pus, or blood, 
the earth is not horrified, humiliated, or disgusted by it. In the same way, agreeable and disagreeable sensory impressions will not take charge of your mind when you develop meditation like the earth. And I'll read one more poem. This is from a great book, The Buddha Before Buddhism, which is a translation of um, perhaps some of the earlier teachings from, from Buddhism. And it's very uh, simple, um, not a lot of kind of, um, kind of theoretical superstructures, just some simple points about really the, the highest aim being peace and how you develop peace through non-clinging to anything. It's really kind of radical in its simplicity, these teachings. So I'll read one of the poems. Violence gives birth to fear. Just look at people and their quarrels. I will speak of my dismay and the way that I was shaken. Seeing people thrashing about like fish in little water and seeing them feuding with each other, I became afraid. The world is completely without a core. Everywhere things are changing. Wanting a place of my own, I saw nothing not already taken. I felt discontent at seeing only conflict to the very end. Then I saw an arrow here, hard to see, embedded in the heart. Pierced by this arrow, people dash about in all directions. When the arrow's pulled out, they don't run and they don't sink. Don't pursue what the world's knotted up in. Having fully pierced sensuality, train in your own full release. Truthful, not impudent, or deceitful, anger-free and never speaking divisively, a sage would overcome avarice and the evil of greed. One should conquer drowsiness, laziness, and sluggishness, and not live negligently. A person intent on full release should not be conceited. One should not be pulled into false speech or become enamored with physical forms. One should fully understand conceit and refrain from a violent life. One shouldn't delight in the old or prefer the new. One shouldn't grieve what's lost or cling to what's attractive. Greed I call the great flood and desire a swift current. Objects of awareness are moving waves and lust is a quagmire difficult to cross. Not deviating from truth, sages, Brahmins stand on dry ground. Giving up everything, they are said to be at peace. Knowing they are ones who know. Knowing the Dharma, they are not dependent. Wandering properly through the world, they do not envy anyone here. They who here have overcome lust, a clinging hard to overcome in this world, don't grieve or worry. They have cut the stream, they are unbound. What was before? Let it wither away. What will be later? Do nothing with it. Not grasping what's in between, you'll live at peace. By not taking as mine, anything that is name and appearance, and not grieving what doesn't exist, one is not diminished in this world. Who doesn't say this is mine or that anything belongs to others doesn't experience selfishness and doesn't grieve thinking I have nothing. When asked, I say the benefit of being unshakable is being even-minded everywhere and being without cruelty, greed, and agitation. For one who knows, who has no agitation, there is no karmic accumulation. Abstaining from karmic activity, one sees safety everywhere. Sages do not say they are inferior, superior, or equal to others. Peaceful, unselfish, they neither embrace nor reject. So there's a lot in that poem, and some of it may resonate and some of it may not. Um, but to me, I think it, it does capture this flavor of equanimity, uh, this possibility of a heart that's um, at peace and, and uh, not caught up in its preferences, peaceful in the world. Okay, I'll stop there. Thanks for listening. Appreciate your kind attention and uh, yeah, we'll open it up. See if people have comments, any questions about anything I've said, experiences from your own life, 
about skillful equanimity or unskillful equanimity. Um, yeah, I'll leave it there and see, see what comes to mind for people. And if people would be willing in the room, maybe to come a little closer so we can gather around the computer and um, that way people will be able to hear, that'd be great. <laughs> 